Hey, good morning, Icon. It is good to be with you guys. Hey, but uh, before we jump in, I just want to uh, say a quick word and invite you into something that I hope you'll participate in with us. And so uh, next Sunday, uh, Justin is going to be back up in Seattle uh, at, at our service in order to do uh, what's called an installation service. And so uh, August 1st, Sunday, um, we're going to have a moment in our service where uh, in a very sober, in a very joyful way, Justin is going to have the opportunity to, uh, in some ways, pass on the role and the title and the duties and the calling of lead pastor to me. And I'm so excited for that. It's going to be such a, it's a meaningful moment for me. But more than that, it's a meaningful moment for our church. And, I, and so I hope that, uh, although you're watching online right now, I hope that you'll come and join us uh, next Sunday on August 1st in order to be there for that and rejoice with where the Lord is taking us and to just come together. And, you know, all through this transition, so much of what you have shared is that it doesn't revolve around the lead guy only, that ultimately we are here because Jesus is good and he wants to do a work through Icon. And so even in my installation service, it's not about Josh Searcy becoming lead pastor. It's about God continuing to move the story of Icon forward. And I hope that you'll come and celebrate that with us, mark that with us as we move forward into the years ahead. Let me, let me pray, and we'll jump into it. Father God, God, I, th- I thank you for your word. I thank you that week in and week out on Sundays, and more than that certainly, but on Sundays we get to vi- revisit your word. And it gets to show us some things in in order for us to have boldness and fruit in the Christian life. And so today, God, as we are are addressing some things that might be uh, uh, some lingering questions for my friends here, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bless your word, would produce fruit in our lives, really really the, the fruit of assurance, God. That by your spirit, you would help us to analyze our lives rightly, Lord, and to see where you're at in them, how you're working in them, and that it would give us a sense of assurance. And and where we need conviction, certainly, God. But I pray that you would assure us, that you would give us the right eyes to see by your spirit who we are in Jesus and all that that could mean for our real life. And so, Father, I I, I do pray that you would, by your power, you would unite your power with my weak words, and you would cause the fruit of assurance and hope in our lives together here at Icon. Father, we love you. We want to love you more. Give us the confidence of your great love even in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today we are in a spot in Romans 8 that is one of my favorite spots. And the the reason why is because, um, you know, one of the things that I have a very uh, sensitive pastoral heart around is the idea of the assurance of salvation is is what it's called. And and we're going to talk about that. And I want to share just a, a little bit about my story uh, with this topic. So uh, some, this is going to feel like a, a hard left turn into something weird, but it's going to connect back. Um, so something to know about me is that I have what's called, I, I have what's called a hypnagogic jerks. I think that's how you say it. Um, but basically what it is, is uh, you know when you're falling asleep and you, uh, you suddenly feel like you're falling and then you like wake up really quickly. Um, it's, it's that, but to a much worse degree. And so basically the way that I, quote unquote, suffer from it is that sometimes, not all the time, um, when I'm going to sleep, especially if I'm very tired, um, I will, like, the right the, the split second before I'm actually asleep, I will all of a sudden jump up or sit up and feel like I, like I, like I can't breathe. I have to, like, catch my breath, and I'm, <gasps> and I have to, it's a, it freaks me out all the time, but that, that's what it is. And, and basically, what, what it is is that, um, when you're very tired, uh, your body, I guess, begins to try to skip that first stage of sleep. You know, your body goes into certain stages while you sleep. And uh, in the first stage, your, your body is really ramping up, like your heart rate goes up. Um, and then as you get into that second stage of sleep, it's when your body calms back down and your, your heart rate drops a good bit. Um, but with hypnagogic jerks, basically, your body totally skips 
that first stage of sleep and goes straight to the second stage where your heart rate drops. And so when that happens and you're not quite asleep yet, your brain knows it and your brain basically says, wake up, wake up, something's happening, your, your heart rate is dropping. And, and so you jump out of bed and, you're, and you, you, you think, you're, <laughs> did I almost just die? But in reality, it's, it's mostly harmless. And, and so I share that because that started for me when I was in the age range of like 20 to 22. And it was in that time of life that I was deeply struggling with whether I was a Christian or not. Deeply analyzing and looking at my life, trying to wonder, did I get this whole thing wrong? Is there really faith in my heart that connects me with Jesus, that can give me some some confidence in the Christian life and give me some peace and assurance? And as I was wrestling through this, that's when these, these hypnagogic jerks began to happen. And it, friends, it terrified me every single night. Every single night, I remember praying, God, please don't let me die in my sleep tonight. Because I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. I don't know if I've really been connected with Jesus Christ by faith and can feel safe. And so please just give me another day to figure this thing out. And then sure enough, I'd be almost falling asleep and then I'd wake up <gasps> freaking out thinking that I almost died. And it, friends, it was a terrible season in my life. It was terrible. But in that season is when the Lord began to really uh, help me unravel pieces of my heart and begin to understand some of what it means to be a Christian, certainly. But then also, very importantly, some important identifiers for the true Christian. And so today, as we're going to talk about some things around what a Christian is, what, what he or she has, I want to say just a pastoral word to you who are struggling with your assurance of salvation. I, I want you to know that I have been there, friends. I know how haunting, how terrifying, how dominating those thoughts can be. And then you just get, you just turn inward on yourself and you're constantly overanalyzing your life. You're constantly looking at yourself. The, the joy of the Christian life seems to be nowhere to be found. And you, you long for the days of when you felt joyful in Jesus, but you don't feel joyful in Jesus because you're so busy trying to figure out whether you actually know him. And so you're in this exhausted place. Not only are you being whipped and beaten down by these questions, but also you're just whipped and beaten down by a general lackluster and even pitiful Christian life because there's no joy in it. Friends, I, I want you to know I know you. I know where I, I know where that can take you. I know how that can dominate your life and totally suck the joy out of life. And it has been my prayer all week long that the Spirit of God would give you something today to help you answer some of those questions and to calm you down. Some of us need to be riled up, certainly. Some of us need to be riled up by conviction and really see the seriousness of our sin. But my guess is if, the, if you are struck, I was talking with someone about this a few months ago. If you are struggling with the assurance of salvation, you are having these questions again and again and again. Friend, it's a good sign. You know, you know, when you are a, when you are, when you're, before you trust in Jesus, these questions might not bother you. They might, you know, they might they, they might disturb you a little bit every now and then, but only a Christian who's seen the value of Jesus Christ and wants to love him, wants to be safe in him, only those are the ones who struggle with these questions. Are the ones who are haunted by these questions because if you weren't I'm getting ahead of myself, but if you weren't a Christian, those questions wouldn't bother you. Those questions wouldn't rile you up like they do. They wouldn't disturb you like they do. Your disturbed nature by some of these questions is actually a good sign that your heart is soft toward the Lord. That the Spirit of God has given you a new heart to want to follow Jesus, to want to love Him, to want to obey Him. 
And that despair that fills in that gap between what you know is true and what the experience of your life is, that, that gap is normal. And the fact that there's despair there, the fact that there's question there, the fact that there's a, a sense of discontent there is a good sign, friend. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I, but I hope that you will see today some of, some of the indicators that you can use in order to be assured that you belong to Jesus Christ. And so, like I said, we are in Romans 8. I, I, I noticed the other day that in our series, in our, what, 12-week series on a few chapters in Romans, six of them come out of Romans 8, and there is a reason for it. I hope that you've seen. This is the, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion, the best chapter in the Bible. So we are in Romans, 9, Romans 8, verses 9 through 11. And as we go through this text, Paul is going to give us, uh, kind of at the beginning, a statement, just a statement that he's going to give, and then the rest of the verses are him kind of unpacking it, explaining it, and I think it's there that we're going to begin to see some of the some of the indicators that we can have of who is really a Christian, who is trusting in Jesus Christ, and who is not. So first, let's read that statement, the what, this truth that Paul gives. You however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Now, this verse can be one of those things that bother us, right? This this is a very on its face, a very clear and bold statement from Paul saying, if you, you are not in the flesh, he just went through that in verses one through eight uh, about what it's like to live in the flesh and to be hostile to God. He says, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the spirit. If in fact, that's a big if, if in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of God in them does not belong to Jesus Christ. Now, like I said, on its face, that's a terrifying statement, but it's also a good statement because it clarifies it. It zeroes in on what some of these indicators are going to be. Because here's the truth of the matter. We use a lot of different indicators in order to either assure ourselves or even draw lines between who's a true Christian and who's not a true Christian. We have all these different systems of thought and You know, if you vote for this party, if you vote for this party, then you either are a Christian or you're not a Christian. We use our moral life. We use some of these things that, we trend, that, that, that we've made up as indicators of whether we belong to Jesus Christ. But in Paul's mind, the one thing, the one thing that you can always look to in order to answer whether you or someone else is a Christian is this one fact. Does the Spirit of God dwell in you? Do you have the Holy Spirit? And that, that can be a weird question because the Holy Spirit has been tied to some very weird things. I hope you're not afraid of the Holy Spirit. But, th- but that's the one question and that's the statement. That's the big statement that Paul gives. And it's good for us to be narrowed in because here's the truth of the matter. We can use a lot of other things in our life, a lot of other false indicators in order to assure us that we love Jesus. You know, when I... When I was uh, when I lived in Dallas, I, I lived in Dallas for a long time. This was a really big problem. A lot of people felt that they were a Christian because they voted for the Republican Party. A lot of people believed that they were a Christian because they were born into this family of Christians. One of my one of my mentors told me one time that he legitimately had someone tell him that he was that they were a Christian because they were born in San Antonio. That's a true story. <laughs> And so we use all these, you know, down in the South, they use all these different, these false indicators on whether you're a Christian or not. But here's the truth of the matter. And I've found this since I've been here in Seattle. That is just as much of a problem here in Seattle. It's values and looks to different indicators, but it is just as much of a problem. Because here's what I think happens in our city. I think that there, because our city 
is in a good way concentrated, focused on, and adamant about justice going into the world, here's what I think you can do. I think you can use, without even noticing it, uh, justice movements in order to assure you that you are a good person. And even for mainline and liberal Christians, in order to assure them, I'm a good Christian. I, I belong to Jesus because I give myself to these move, movements, because I care for the poor, because I care for racial reconciliation and racial justice in our city, because I care about homeless people. All of those things are good. Yes, absolutely. But they cannot be what indicates whether we are a Christian or not. They can be a little bit of evidence, but they cannot be the thing that assures us that we know and love and trust Jesus. And so move, I mean, move the wheels of justice forward, but do not for a second think that that is what should assure you ultimately that you are a Christian. That is a result, that is an evidence, that is a fruit of Christianity, of caring for the poor. Jesus makes it very clear about that. But Paul zeroes in here and gives you one indicator. It's the Holy Spirit. Do you have him or do you not? Now, that's a very vague question, right? Like, who is the Holy Spirit? What does it look like in our lives? And so thankfully, Paul knows that it's a vague question and he goes on. He begins to kind of explain what that means, how to really see whether you have the Spirit of God or not. If that's such an important indicator on, on to whether we be, belong to Jesus Christ or not, let's, let's get some clarity on how we can find whether we have the Spirit or not. And so here in verse 10, listen to this. But if, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, stop. Stop right there. So what Paul begins to do as he begins to unpack and explain this statement of the Spirit of God being the indicator for whether we, believe, whether we belong to Jesus, the first thing he does, I hope you see this, is that he begins to say what it doesn't mean. What it doesn't mean when he says that if, you have this, if, if having the Spirit, here's what that doesn't mean. And what it doesn't mean is right now, current state of perfection. What does he say? Although the body is dead because of sin. And so Paul gives at the, at the front of this explanation, this reality of you having the spirit of God does not mean perfectionism, does not yet mean sinlessness. It does not mean you are free from frailty or weakness or temptation or even death itself. And this is important for us. This addresses some ambiguity in the Christian life. That the Holy Spirit's presence doesn't yet mean perfection or complete freedom. Listen to how the commentator Douglas Moo says this. In an effort to maintain balance that is typical of Romans, Paul goes on to comment about a situation in which the Spirit's dominance might not be so obvious. The believer's continued existence in a physical body that is doomed to die and is still all too susceptible to the influence of sin. So Paul, himself being carried along by the Holy Spirit to write these words, is, is wise enough, has enough wits about him, and is experienced enough with other Christians to know that he first, in order for, to, uh, to help people understand and analyze whether they have the Holy Spirit, he first has to say, here's what that doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that you no longer have a body or a heart or a mind that is still susceptible to frailty and weakness and even death. And this is important, friends, because this, like I said, addresses some ambiguity in the Christian life, because when we have this question of assurance of whether we have the Holy Spirit, it is so often driven and focused toward what we are getting right. That we constantly think through and analyze, and the, the way that we assure ourselves is to say, okay, where has, where, what areas of my life can I point to in, in order to show there's no more sin here? There's no more struggle here. I've no longer done this. I'm no longer doing this. I no longer struggle with this. And 
from this text, I think we see that's not the right way to do it. That's not the, that's not the path. That's not the route towards real assurance. But it's rather to first address and acknowledge and admit, I am still susceptible. I am still tempted towards sin, of course. I still have this body that is broken down. I still have this body that has impulses and temptations that that, that pull me away from Jesus. I can't escape that right now. And so I shouldn't use the escape from that or even the uh, what I would what you would say the like perfectionist freedom from that in order to assure, assure me whether I have the spirit of God or not. I can't free myself from this body. I can't free myself from its impulses quite yet. Can they be changed? Can they be redirected? Absolutely. We're going to get into that in a second. But first, we have to admit that we exist in a state right now that is not perfect, that is not full of power and strength to to rule over and against sin, to put sin completely away. So for me, when I, you know, one of my besetting sins is anxiety. This deep sense of unbelief in God's goodness, in his providence, in his power, I know I've shared this before. I know anxiety is, I know for me as well, a, a, a psychological and physiological condition. But I also know that I have a heart that kicks against the, the, the loss of control, that kicks against some of the things that would, requ- that would give me peace to trust in God. And the truth of the matter is, is that I have chemical imbalances in my brain that probably for the rest of my life, are going to pull me that way. And so I shouldn't be surprised when I'm rattled and racked with anxiety. I shouldn't be surprised by that. I should, I should, you and I should not use this, this, this barometer of the extinction of sin and of temptation and of struggle in our life as to whether we're a Christian or not. Because that's not going to happen, friend. So for you today, you need to recognize you're still vulnerable. Having the Spirit of God, what it doesn't mean is a current, present state of perfection, power, and sinlessness. The body is still dead because of sin. But then he goes on. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And so Paul, Paul leans in here and kind of, it seems to take it a different direction. He, he puts these, these contrasts two together that make up the contrast of the Christian life, that you are still tempted, that you are still broken, you are still struggling with sin, and yet the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is life because of righteousness. That in that, that, that dynamic, that you still struggle, yes, but there's also still something there. There's something happening. L- listen to how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 4.16. So we do not lose heart. Wouldn't that be good to say in your struggle with assurance? Though our outer self is wasting away, though my body is continuing to be broken down and still tempted towards sin, our inner self, is being renewed day by day. That in the Christian, there is a new inner inner principle in in, in the true believer that that longs to be renewed and, and to walk in obedience to God. That yes, you still struggle, but there's also something happening in you. Slowly but surely, there's a if I can use this phrase, even though it has some cultural connotations, there's an inner light that is progressively growing and growing and growing and growing that gives you the desire and the renewed and redirected desire to obey God, to see him as the greatest good in your life. But again, this something, this new principle, this direction and and renewal of life is something that is created in us. Paul doesn't say that our spirit, that the human spirit is alive because of our righteousness, but that 
the Holy Spirit is life because of the righteousness of Jesus. Remember, that's what he says. But if Christ is in you, so if you have been united to Jesus Christ, you've been included in him by faith, you have thrown your lot in with Jesus, and he has given everything he is to you. Is righteousness included? If that's true of you, then the Holy Spirit is life, is bringing new life because of the righteousness of Jesus. And so it's not, again, on this question of assurance. Not only do we look to the extinction of sin, but we also look to our own power to create new life. And Paul says here, that's not the way. That's not the way you do it. That's not what you look to. But you look for something to be created in you, a new life. A new life that comes inside of you by the Holy Spirit. That isn't something you cook up or manufacture, but something that is given to you because of the righteousness that's already yours in Jesus Christ that you also didn't create, cook up, or conjure. And so we can can look at our life and see that the Spirit of God is doing something inside of us, that we are being renewed day by day. That there is a, that although there's still struggle with sin and breakdown in my body, in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit, there's still breakdown there, still polluted with sin, there's also renewal that's slowly happening over a lifetime that the Spirit of God is creating in me in union with Jesus. Martin Luther said it this way, this dependence on the Spirit of God to to, to do these things in me, trusting in Jesus. My, My holiness righteousness and purity do not stem from me, nor do they depend on me. They come solely from Christ and are based only in him, in whom I am rooted by faith just as sap flows from the stalk into the branches. And so Paul, like, just to catch you up, make sure you're still tracking with me, he has this big statement, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you belong to Jesus. If he doesn't, you don't belong to Jesus. What it means for the Spirit of God to, what it doesn't mean for the Spirit of God to dwell in you is that you have perfection. You're, you're still going to struggle and be tempted. But what it does mean also is that you will experience some sense of renewal, that you will have a desire to obey God. Listen, if you don't have, if there's not an... <laughs> If there's not a flicker of desire to to love God more, to submit to him, to see him as the greatest good of your life, if if that desire is nowhere in your life, you are not a Christian. That's a hard word, but the the Bible has, has no category for identifying as a Christian with zero desire to follow Jesus with zero desire to submit to him, with zero sense of his beauty and worth to love him as he deserves, the Bible has no category for that. We are being renewed in our love. Now again, this does not mean perfection. So Don't get worked up because you are struggling right now, even if you don't feel this desire. Do you desire to desire? I've said that in my own life, in my own prayer life sometimes. God, I don't quite want you, but I want to want you. Is that there? That's a flicker of desire. That's a flicker of the Spirit of God producing something in you, trying to get you back to look at God and to rejoice in Him and submit to Him, to see your life as found in Him. Even that want of a want, even that desire of a desire is a good thing. That's the Spirit of God. Give, that's, that's the Spirit of life giving that to you. That's what that is. So having the Spirit of God does not mean perfection. It does not mean sinlessness. It does not mean complete power over sin. But it does mean a a, a, a growing, progressing, waxing and waning, waxing and waning desire to submit to and love God. To trust in Him. To love Him. To offer up our real lives to Him in submission and in joy. That's what the spirit of life does. He creates new life. And it's when we trust in Jesus, it's when we believe that we are in Christ and his righteousness is ours, that we can begin to experience some of this new life. And so again, a a word to those struggling with assurance. 
Look to Jesus. It's actually some assurance of who Jesus is to you in the foundation that can never be shaken of his righteousness that will actually begin to re-spark and reignite some of that life in you. Listen to how J.C. Ryle says this on assurance and how it manifests and works out in our Christian life. Now, assurance goes far to set a child of God free. It enables him to feel that the great business of life is a settled business, the great debt a paid debt, the great disease a healed disease, and the great work a finished work. And all other business, diseases, debt, and works are then by comparison small. In this way, assurance makes him patient in tribulation, calm under bereavements, unmoved in sorrow, not afraid of evil tidings. In every condition, content, content, for it gives him a fixedness of heart. It sweetens his bitter cups. It lessens the burdens of his crosses. It smooths the rough places over which he travels, and it lightens the valley of the shadow of death. It makes him always feel that he has something solid beneath his feet and something firm under his hands, a sure friend by the way and a sure home at the end. That's what assurance can do for us. It can actually be the the reigniting spark of some of this life that the Spirit wants to give us. And so we trust in Jesus. We we look to him to create this new life. That's where assurance comes. It's, it's, It's not from you just getting your life together. It's not from you, yes, discipline is good. Don't ever hear me down on discipline. But discipline is a terrible measure of your Christianity. Discipline is a terrible barometer for whether you belong to Jesus. Discipline, as fickle as so many of us are, if that was the indicator of whether we belong to Jesus, many of us would not be Christians. (laughs) So we can't look to those things. We look to Jesus alone. And when we look to Jesus and have this assurance that Ryle is talking about, it actually reignites some of that life to to, to, to love Jesus more, to trust him in trial, to, to endure hard things in love and in trust of him, which in itself just pays dividends back into our assurance, which pays dividends back into our real energy in Christian life. And so we don't look to ourselves. We look to what the Spirit is doing in us based off of the righteousness of Jesus. And I want to finish this text on this because J.C. Rowley he says this, it's a sure, we have a sure friend by the way and a sure home at the end. Interestingly enough, that's where Paul takes it as well. Let me read verse 10 again and then we'll finish this text. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so Paul ends on this high note of new life that will be free from corruption, that will be free from this body that's still tempted towards sin. And he bases it again off of what has been done in Jesus Christ. He says, hey, if the Spirit of God God dwells in you, if you see this new life and this new principle trending your life toward righteousness and holiness in love of God, if you see that, you can be assured that there is coming a day, friend, where that body of sin, where that body that's still frail, the mortal body that's tempted towards sin and weakness, that will be no more. Not because you won't have a body, but because you will have a new body, just like Jesus Christ. That the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead is what we believe as Christians. And being united to him, our story is now included and embedded in his, in his resurrection story. And that is the great assurance of the Christian. Is that my great hope in life? It's not this life. It's not this body. It's not this job. It's not this whatever. It's this. That to be a Christian means that I, by faith, embed myself in this new story 
at which the center is Jesus Christ, who's paid for my sin, washed me clean, we've seen that in Romans 8, who's given me an account of righteousness that can never be lost, and is pooling and directing my life and even the world itself toward newness, permanent newness. And that's what we hope in. This is the great hope of union with Jesus Christ, that the new life Jesus has and will forever have will become ours. These bodies won't be tempted towards sin any longer. These bodies won't be, quote-unquote, mortal any longer. But because of the Spirit of God, following what he's already done in Jesus, will raise us from the grave and give us a new life with a new body and a new heavens and new earth. This is the great victory of your Christian life, friend. This is the great hope that your story does not end at death. Your story does not end at what seems like the defeat of death. But it will be carried on through that into newness of life by the Holy Spirit. And that's the great promise. So Paul gives this great statement. He says what it doesn't mean. He says what it does mean. And then there he says what it will mean. That if you have the Spirit of God, you have every reason to be hopeful about your life. And on longer terms than your life that there is a great hope of resurrection and of power that will never be weakened by temptation or sin. Frailty will be gone. Temptation towards sin will be gone. And so right now, again, I started this whole thing off talking about the assurance of salvation. Right now, this this doubt that you're feeling, this, this mind that feels like it's so obsessed with how you're failing, that will be no more. You have a new mind that fully trusts in who God is. A new heart that fully loves who God is. A new body that will not be broken down, but will be in complete service to love our great God and enjoy Him forever. (laughs) That's our great hope. And so friends, I just, in this, I want to to give just a real life application. I've been doing this a lot in our live in-person sermons, but we say a lot that we want to make disciples who follow Jesus faithfully in real life. And so I want to take some time to give just a quick little word on how you apply this to real life. If this is true, if this is true, that to have the Spirit of God does not mean you are perfect yet, does mean that you are being renewed, and will mean that you will be raised, in your real life, let go of pessimism. I've noticed that a lot of people who struggle with the assurance of of salvation are deeply pessimistic people, mostly about themselves. But if this is true, that to have the Spirit of God doesn't mean you're perfect, and to have the Spirit of God means you're growing, and having the Spirit of God means you will be raised, then pessimism makes no sense. There's no reason for pessimism in your failure because it's the truth of the matter that God has already identified for you. And there's no reason for pessimism and whether you're going to grow or not because you have the Spirit of God leading you there. And there's no pessimism that can be attached to our future because we're going to be raised in Jesus Christ. And so I'm not telling you to be some rose-colored glasses optimist. I'm telling you to be a Christian realist that identifies where you're still broken that anticipates growth and new life by the Holy Spirit right now, progressively more and more, and that anticipates with great hope the end of the story, which will be new life. Pessimism has no place there, whether about yourself or about this world. Don't be an optimist, but be a Christian realist that takes the hope of Christianity that Jesus has established in his life, death, and resurrection as the true story of the world and of your life. So catch yourself this week where you're really falling into pessimism, where you're really giving into this negative mindset of like, well, if I was a Christian, I wouldn't be struggling with this. That's not true. And this pessimism of I'll never be able to grow. Well, yes, you can because the spirit of life can create it in you. And this pessimism that this world is going nowhere, my life is going nowhere, my life feels over. No, friend, your life is not over. Your life will end in victory forever. So we can take with realism 
and with confidence the Christian hope. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you have included us in this great story of where you're taking the world. It's a great future. It's a great hope. And though we are lashed this in this life with disappointment and despair and grief, this pessimism that radiates throughout the world, God, we have great reason for hope, even as strugglers, God, even as present and current failures, God. We have great reason for hope. So God, I, I pray again for my friends to just have a renewal in hope, God, a renewal in confidence that gives them assurance of who they are in Jesus and, and that that sure foundation, that firm thing under their hands that Ryle talks about would energize them forward to endure trials, to walk over the rough land, quote unquote, to lessen the burden of their crosses, to make even the most bitter cups sweet. Lord, it can happen. It can happen because we are who we are in Jesus and because what the Spirit of God can do in us. So would your Spirit do a work in us, Lord, create new life and new hope because of the future that is ours being included in Jesus. We love you. We entrust our whole selves to you, failures and all, hopes and all, despairs and all, questions and doubts and all. In Jesus' name, amen.